Good afternoon. In speaking to you, you must recognize, of course, that I'm speaking in a far different way than would be the case if I were giving a lecture or teaching a class. In other words, we have to acknowledge to begin with that we have a very special relationship with each other. A teacher, a practitioner, a tape group leader of the infinite way has a very special relationship with the teacher, with the workers at headquarters, with any of our teachers or lecturers in any part of the world. And they must all feel this, otherwise they cannot adequately serve. In other words, in the years of our relationship, you have witnessed that there is no one greater than another, there is no one standing above another, there is no one looking down upon another, that a spiritual relationship actually reveals the bond that exists between all men, all women, everywhere, and therefore sets forth the only real equality there is. You read a great deal in the press these days about equality because of the racial disturbances and because of in some countries, titles, and those that have no titles. And uh, you would think, actually, that all men are equal. Of course, all men are not equal. All men may have been created equal, but some of them chose to take advantage of the opportunities that society gave them for education, art, culture. Others decided to play the game in a different way. You can hardly call these equal. Some races have been held without education and opportunity. They also could not be termed equal. They are equal in potentiality, and they're equal in the sight of God, and they should be equal, and probably they would be equal if there was more love thy neighbor as thyself in the world. But actually, <clears throat> equality isn't something that a governmental decree can give anyone. Equality isn't anything that society can bestow on anyone. Equality is something that we can earn and deserve. Nevertheless, the moment we get into the universe of spirit, there is an equality of a different nature. We are equal then as children of God, as heirs of God, joint heirs. But you see, that equality can only take place upon recognition. If I recognize the statement, call no man on earth your father, but God is my father, then naturally I must accept that this is a universal relationship. And therefore, that God is your father. And therefore, 
I accept equality on that basis that we are brothers and sisters in God. <clears throat> now, that does not mean that we are all equal in our activities because there are thousands of students of the infinite way to whom I would not wish to entrust teaching work or healing work or hate group work. And the question has been asked, well, am I not equal? Not in my eyes, no. Oh, you're equal in potentiality, but you haven't yet uh, arrived at the state of consciousness that would equip you for this position. We may all be equal, but there are lots of people that I wouldn't want to be my banker or my lawyer in spite of our equality in other directions. Now, in the infinite way, we do not encourage students to seek to be teachers or practitioners or take group leaders. We encourage, rather, that the student devote their time to developing their spiritual consciousness until the call comes, until an opportunity comes for rightful service. And then, consciousness having been established, the rest fulfills itself. Now, on this very subject, I wish to show you an important point. That which calls us to a spiritual service performs the service through us so that there is never any responsibility on our shoulders. There is never a task given to us that is beyond our means or beyond our capacity or beyond our ability because that which has called us likewise serves. To illustrate that very graphically, I can assure you that every year of the past 17 years it has cost more money to maintain the activity of the infinite way than I ever dreamed of owning. And therefore, one might have said at the beginning, well then you can't undertake this work. You are not financially equipped or supplied. But I did undertake the work without script or person, without taking thought. Why? Because I did not enter this work of my own free will and accord, I was called to it. And I have to accept the fact that that which called me would maintain, sustain, prosper, and so it has been. Now, everything that has been necessary for the activity of the infinite way. Publishing houses, foreign publishing houses, translations, everything has appeared as the need arose. There has never been any seeking of any of these things. They have all come right to our doorstep. And the answer is that always always, my function has been to be still and remember that no man could have invented the principles of the infinite way. They must have been an unfoldment, an activity of the divine consciousness. And therefore, the consciousness which is aiming them at human consciousness in this age, that consciousness establishes them. Now here's an important point because 
It involves impersonalization, which is one of our greatest principles. Supposing I had believed that God was giving me these principles of the infinite way for my benefit, to heal me or to enrich me or to uh, make me a spiritual something or other. Do you see how I would have lost the entire message and the mission of the infinite way? It was only because I recognized from the beginning that God doesn't give any great messages to anybody for themselves any more than God gave Buddha or Jesus messages or Paul for their benefit. No, when, when we receive a message, uh, then we are but the instruments or messengers carrying it, and the message must be meant for all consciousness. Well, it is in the same way. When you individually receive some measure of enlightenment, I hope you will never feel that God has done this for you. Because be assured, it isn't that way. It has been given to you that through you it may reach the world. It may start with just the world of your own family. It may start with the world of a few neighbors. It may start with the world of a few who may be led to you for healing or teaching or tapes. The size of the world doesn't matter. <clears throat> the first world that was led to me was a family of father, mother, and son. That was my first class. So, the important point is this. You must individually understand that whatever measure of spiritual grace has been given to you has not been given to you for your aggrandizement or that you may be set aside as a spiritual poobah, but actually that it has been granted to you to make of you a servant, a servant of the Most High. Far better to be a servant in the household of the Lord than it is to be a great master out in the world. And therefore, every spiritual light that you receive, every spiritual grace that you receive, look upon it as that which is to make of you a better servant, a better server, a better messenger. In the same way, one of the things that is very noticeable in our activity is that as students begin to heal and adequately teach, that their income, their personal income, becomes abundant. Well, the same way, a tremendous mistake could be made, and one could feel that God is making them uh, rich or abundant. That's not true. That's not true. This added things that are coming is also part of the spiritual fruitage and part of the tools with which we serve. We receive money and we spend money. We are not receiving all of this money for our personal wealth. We are receiving it really as a part of our ministry. And so it goes back into the ministry. I realize I'm saying this poorly. But at least I am trying to convey the idea that in your spiritual studies and meditations you are going to receive God's grace. You are going to receive it either as a healing gift, a teaching gift. You are going to receive it as additional supply, additional health. But remember this, it isn't being given to you for you. It is being given to you 
that you may be a better servant, a more adequate servant in the household of the Lord. Then, then you will be able to realize at all times no demand is ever made upon me personally. Every demand that is made upon me is a demand upon the Christ. In other words, it is really a, de a demand upon that which has given me the message. And therefore, it is fulfilled through me. Never by me, always through me. As you realize this, you will never have occasion to be disturbed by the question, can I meet this? Now, it doesn't mean always that you are going to quickly meet every call for help that comes to you, whether for physical, mental, moral, or financial help. It doesn't mean that at all, because you are not the only person involved. There is also the one asking for help. And there are times and there are circumstances under which they do not respond quickly or fully. And this has nothing to do with you or your ability. It has to do with their own unfoldment because we are dealing primarily with the subject of consciousness. We are not dealing with just changing a sick body into a healthy one. We are not dealing with just turning an unemployed person into an employed one. We are not dealing with just turning a sick person into a well one. We are dealing with consciousness. And therefore, the help that we give is meant primarily to lift our students and patients into higher consciousness so that these things may be added unto them. Well, now, sometimes they themselves prevent the block. I received a letter in my mail today from someone who, from whom I've never heard before, but they have read some infinite weight books and said that I have written a lot about supply and will I lend them five hundred dollars? <laughs> well, now you can see that if my treatment doesn't readily bring them supply, you can see why. <coughs> Their idea of supply isn't God realization, it's five hundred dollars. <laughs> and uh, so it is that somebody else occasionally will write, that they're not interested right now in learning about truth, just getting well so they'll have the health to learn about it afterwards. So do not always judge of your spiritual development by whether or not your patients are immediately getting uh, their sense of uh, demonstration met, because their sense of demonstration and ours may be two different things. Silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I unto thee, and then some of them say, oh, but it's silver and gold I'm interested in. The point that you are to watch is this. Do not judge of your spiritual progress by any material sign, because you can be misled. Do not judge by any material sign. Then what are we to judge by? Well, why judge? Why judge at all? Why be concerned even? As long as we are living according to our highest standard of our spiritual awareness, studying to the highest of our capacity, meditating to the highest of our capacity, can we do any more than that? Of course we cannot. Therefore, there is no way to hurry our progress. The only thing that should disturb us, if we have to acknowledge, well, I must admit I am not doing the best that I'm capable of, or I am wasting time in uh, things that are, represent a waste, <clears throat> then, of course, we have to make an adjustment. But the progress, try not to judge of that. I can tell you definitely that there is no way to
to judge of one's progress. You may today have a complete feeling of frustration, barrenness, insufficiency, and tomorrow be lifted right up to cloud nine. You have no idea of what lies ahead of you an hour from now, or a day from now, or a month from now. You have no idea of your progress, and it is for this reason, that just as in nature we can be watching our crops, trees, flower bushes in the spring and see not a sign of a bud or a leaf and then decide that we are not doing well at all. And it may be just tomorrow that those buds begin to appear, those leaves, those blossoms. And then we realize that there is no way of watching progress until it happens. When it happens, we've seen the progress. Before that, we had no way of knowing what was what. And so it is with us. I have witnessed in my own experience that I could seem to be a million miles away from spiritual demonstration and then really in the twinkling of an eye the entire picture changes. I have witnessed with healings what appeared to me to be no progress whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, uh, again, in the twinkling of an eye, the change took place. I have no way of understanding it. That's why in none of my books do I explain it. I have no way of understanding it. I merely know that it is a fact that if I am living up to my highest concept of spiritual principles, that undoubtedly there is an inner progress going on. Probably the reason that I can't feel progress is that I can't feel spiritual. I never have felt spiritual. I don't know what it's like to feel spiritual. I can only feel that I am myself. If that's spiritual, make the best of it. If it isn't, I'll still have to make the best of it. But I don't know what it is to feel spiritual. And therefore, I have no way of knowing whether I'm more spiritual one day than another day because I didn't feel any less or more yesterday. I do have periods of feeling barren. Ah, that's quite a different thing. That feeling of barrenness is always a prelude to a greater unfoldment. I, I never have a uh, greater unfoldment of principles without there first being a period of barrenness. And sometimes a period of barrenness when I wish that God would take the whole blooming message of the infinite way and uh, give it to somebody else. But as long as I can be patient through that, and sometimes it really requires uh, more Emma's being patient than me, because I can get very uppity and say, I'm going to bed, and just hide my head in the pillows, and that's that. What else is it to do? I can't fight City Hall. And so the only thing for me to do is just give up and wait. And when I do, as a rule, something very fine happens. It happened on this uh, trip that I had one of those periods when I felt sorry for Emma because I really was ugly and... Uh, and no mood for anything or anybody, and finally just did decide to go to bed. And I stayed in bed all afternoon and evening, and then in the middle of the night I had the vision. Then I woke her up and told her about it. And that made up to her. <laughs> but try, try not to be too elated when these great spiritual revelations come. Rejoice. 
Yes, 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 rejoice, but don't be too elated because the feeling isn't going to last. There's going to be a settling back into normalcy and then eventually there's going to be barrenness again and you'll have to fight the whole thing all over again. So learn to accept that and learn to accept the fact that the reason for it is that I of my own self am nothing. It's only by the grace of God that these messages come and therefore I must learn to accept them in the way that I can accept them, whatever that way is. But I emphasize that above all things, remember that every spiritual grace that is given to you is not for you. It is only that you may be a better servant. It is for all of human consciousness. That is why this grace is given to us. Every bit of <clears throat> grace you receive benefits someone else. It may have an effect upon someone in your family, someone in your friendship circle, business circle, eventually, uh, students. But you will find that this world will be better off for every spiritual unfoldment that you have in some way or other. Therefore, do not be in too much of a hurry to serve. Give yourself as much as possible to the developing of your own consciousness and then when the opportunity and the call for service comes, then remember that that which called you serves through you. Then you'll be impersonalizing, then you'll never be caught in a position where you haven't a message or where you haven't the right uh, word of God or the right treatment. Never, never, because you will know that the demand that is being made upon you is really being made upon that which called you. And then you will settle back into your meditation and you will receive whatever it is that is necessary. Now, <clears throat> this brings us to a very important uh, principle in the message of the infinite way. I have told you that the Bible has led more people astray than it has ever benefited. The faith that people have in the Bible has been more harmful to them than good. And the reason is that it has never been explained to them that the Bible promises are not for them and that the Bible promises are not going to come true for them. And so, century after century, people buy the Bible and read the Bible and read these promises and rely on them and then wonder why nothing ever happens. Why doesn't it come true that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Why doesn't it come true that none of these evils will come nigh thy dwelling place. Why doesn't it come true that God is uh, the healer? Why doesn't it come true that all the land that you can see from this mountaintop is given unto you? Why, for most people, not even a, a, an acre or a half acre of ground has been given unto them. And yet they've been promised all that you can see from the top of a mountain. Why are these Bible promises not fulfilled? Well, you are the only people in the world today who have the answer. Nobody but Infinite Way students has the answer to that, although it's in the Bible. That the natural man receiveth not the things of God. That the natural man is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be. Ah, you see, that's been hidden. That's been hidden. None of the spiritual promises was ever meant 
for a man whose breath is in his nostrils. Seek ye for a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? And the master says, My kingdom is not of this world. And so you see that we have gone for dozens of centuries of poverty stricken people, diseased people, enslaved people, and none of the Bible promises have come to pass. And lots of these peoples were Christian people who had the Christian Bible promises, and lots were Hebrews who had the promises of Hebrews. Can you imagine the feeling of the Hebrews in Germany when they uh, were marching to their death and uh, perhaps repeating within themselves, none of these uh, evils will come nigh thy dwelling place? And wondering, well, what did that uh, passage of Scripture mean? It sure is coming nigh our dwelling place too nigh. Well, oh yes, and the Christian missionaries carried the Bible to Japan. And can you imagine the Japanese Christians when they felt that atomic bomb coming on them and then remembered the promises, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Do you not see that you must individually awaken to this message of the infinite way so that you actually do see why there is an infinite way in this generation, why the time has come for, at least for you, to awaken to the fact that you are never going to receive God's grace as long as you are a man whose breath is in his nostril. You are not going to receive God's blessings as long as you are living by the law of uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You are not going to receive God's blessings as long as you are holding your enemies in condemnation. Until you become children of God, meaning thereby praying for your enemies, forgiving 70 times 7, loving your neighbor as yourself, fulfilling, in other words, the uh, message and the mission of Christ Jesus, until you are literally living Christianity, or Buddhism, they're all the same, until you are living that, you do not become children of God. When you pray for your enemy, he says, you become children of God. Well, you have to try it and see if it's true. We have two long passages of scripture. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Inasmuch as ye have not done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have not done it unto me. And then see whether you are fulfilling those two passages. See whether you are fulfilling all that is in those passages, and then you will know whether or not you may call yourself children of God, and therefore expect the grace of God, the blessings of God. Now, in some degree, each one of us have already proven that we are children of God in some degree, and we've already proven that we have received some grace of God in some degree. And so we know that what we have to do is continue until our oneness with God is greater in realization than it is now. But this likewise shows us what our function is with our students and with our patients and with those who come to hear the tapes. We are to impart to them 
the heart and soul of the infinite way which is don't believe any of these Bible pr promises and don't believe any of the infinite way promises as long as you are determined to live the purely human life as long as you are going to judge your neighbor criticize condemn as long as you are going to withhold benevolence as long as you are not living in the realization of oneness you're living as mortal man and Bible is very clear that you must drop your mortality in order to take on your immortality therefore the Bible promises were not made for mortality for mortal man and it's for this reason that you are told that you must drop your mortality when you as teachers practitioners take group leaders of the infinite way know these principles of the infinite way you can serve and you will be called upon to serve and that which calls you to service will perform the service through you Now, this mortal man, that which Paul called the natural man, the creature, the human being, there is a way of bringing him into divine sonship. And it is for this reason that we have a ministry. It was not only my mission to go out into the world to tell you that the human being, the man of earth, was not under the law of God, but also how to take the man of earth and lift him up into sonship if you merely go out and tell people that they are human beings and they are men of earth and they're not under the law of God neither indeed can be uh, all you can do is leave them more hopeless than when they came to you and that's not your function your function is to reveal this to them and then say under divine sonship you then come under the law of God and the law of grace and uh, in coming to me you are not coming merely for better health or more supply or more happiness but you are coming primarily to be lifted out of being the man of earth into being that man who has his being in Christ in other words you are coming to me to be divested of mortality and reclothed with immortality now then you yourself must know definitely how this is achieved you're not fully ready for the call until you do know how it is achieved It is achieved by recognizing that this natural man, this man of earth, and all that concerns him is an illusion, is not a reality. 
that all that concerns man whose breath is in his nostril is the illusion created by the five physical senses which are built on the belief of two powers, good and evil. In the moment that instead of judging the sick, the sinner, the poor, the slave, instead of judging them and saying, how can we improve their lot? You drop them from your thought and retire inwardly in meditation that God may reveal to you the Son of God. Now, watch this so that I may illustrate it for you. In imagination, we will say that you are each calling upon me now for help for some problem of humanhood. Uh, one is sick and wants to be made well, and one is poor and wants more abundance, and one is unemployed and wants employment, and one is unhappily married and wants happiness. And you have each presented me with these problems. Now, were I a psych psychologist, I would immediately go to work with each one of you and try to give you the opposite of what you now have. But, from a standpoint of the infinite way, I completely forget the picture that you have presented to me and I turn within. And I realize the Son of God is spiritual. The child of God is neither a sick human nor a well human, neither a sinning human nor a saintly human, neither an unemployed human nor an employed human. Neither an unhappy human nor a happy human. All that constitutes the pairs of opposites exists in the realm of illusion. Exists in the realm of images and thought. All based on the belief in two powers, the Adam dream, the Adam man. But I and my father are one. Now, if I claim that about Joel, remember this, that I would have to be a supreme egotist unless I could also say that must be a universal relationship. As a matter of fact, if I say I and the Father are one and believe that it means only Jesus Christ, I must be a paganistic religionist. Because only the purest kind of paganism could really believe that Jesus would say, I and the Father are one, and mean him alone. Especially in view of his many times saying, my Father and your Father, and call no man on earth your Father. There is but one Father. Therefore, every mystic knows, and has always known, that I and the Father are one is a universal relationship between God and his Son. It doesn't mean uh, that human beings are one with God. That's the delusion of a lot of metaphysical teachings, that they really believe that human beings are one with God. Well, you know right well that there wouldn't be a sick, sinning, <coughs> poor human being in the world if they were one with God. I know. It means that you must understand this point of demarcation. You must understand that when the Master says, I and the Father are one, he is speaking of God and his spiritual offspring. And then, when you take the next step and realize that all that constitutes the human scene represents the illusion of the senses, <coughs> and 
And do not try to improve it. Do not try to reduce a fever. Do not try to remove a lump. Do not try to uh, build up somebody's weight or take down somebody's weight. That is not the way of a spiritual practice. A spiritual practice is one in which the practitioner learns to commune with God within themselves, seek always that God reveal to me the truth of being. It isn't going to be the truth about my being, it's going to be the truth about all being. There cannot be a truth of my being that isn't a truth of your being. Otherwise, what kind of a God are you worshipping? God does not have stepchildren. And God does not have illegitimate children. And God does not have disinherited children. God does not have fallen children. The sons of God are intact, spiritually intact, living and moving and having their being in him. And all that we behold with the five physical senses represents the illusion of sense. And you do not try to improve it. You merely try to realize the illusoriness of that appearance. And then a miracle happens. You do understand, I know, that the infinite way has revealed that each of us has a spiritual awareness, a faculty, a spiritual faculty. In the human being, it is not awakened. That is what separates the human being from the child of God. The human being, without the soul faculty awakened, is uh, the natural man who receiveth not the things of God, knoweth not the things of God, is not under the law of God. The same individual with the soul faculty awakened is the child of God. The same individual. The woman taken in adultery is uh, the mortal, the material, the uh, one who is not under the law of God. That same individual a moment later, having recognized the Christ and been spiritually illumined, so that she recognizes the Christ, she now is the daughter of God, the offspring of God, pure, 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 pure. Not one taint attaches itself. Not one taint attaches itself to the person who has been spiritually awakened. Though your sins were scarlet, you're white as snow. Now, you might say that the whole aim of the message of the infinite way is to awaken that soul faculty in man. Because that is what constitutes the dying to humanhood and being reborn of the spirit. Just awakening that soul faculty. Now, <clears throat> It has been discovered that it is more easily awakened in those who seek spiritual light than in the others. In other words, you might find it difficult at first to awaken that spiritual soul capacity in the, the person who has read my books on supply and then wants a loan at $500. And the reason is that she has read just what you've read, but she hasn't discerned the nature of supply of the Christ. She has only discerned the evidences of wealth. So it is. There are many people who will come to us seeking health, happiness, supply, who will not be easily awakened. Because all they see in us is the fruitage of our spiritual development, not the source of it. The Master had that same thing to contend with. 
when he said he sought me for the loaves and fishes. I really showed you the principle yesterday, but you weren't looking for the principle. You were looking for the loaves and fishes. Now you want more. Had you discerned the principle yesterday, you wouldn't have had to come back today. That's so it is. You should not be in the practice or teaching unless you have discerned the spiritual nature of the Christ in man. When you have discerned that, you are automatically the practitioner or the teacher because you are no longer witnessing just their bodies or their pocketbooks. Now through your spiritual discernment, you are bearing witness to that which is the reality of their being and that it is that awakens them. It is your recognition. Your recognition. When you can look right, uh, you might say, through the eyes of the person and not see the body and not see the condition and not see the pocketbook and not see the lack of pocketbook, when you can look right through them and see the spark of God, then you awaken that soul faculty in them. As long as you are thinking of the stand, from the standpoint of just changing their sickness into health or their lack into abundance, you are not yet called to a spiritual service. You are still in the realm of just wanting to help the human race. That's as good as far as it goes, but it is not our particular ministry. Our particular ministry is arousing or awakening the soul of man to his spiritual identity. And then the miracle takes place. You see, when Paul says, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth my life, you must remember that it's only because he has been awakened to the Christ. You can't say that before you've been awakened to it. That is also the mistake of people who rely on scriptures uh, as if they were uh, literally true. They read in there that uh, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth my life, and they believe that all human beings can go out and say the same thing. That's not true at all. It's true as a potentiality. When the Christ has been raised up in you, you will soon discover that you are not living your life, that Christ is living your life, making your decisions for you. But remember that to make that statement while you are yet man of earth is to fall into the same pit that all these people fall into who go to church. They pray on Sunday and they think that Monday everything's going to be fine. <clears throat> but Monday somehow doesn't come. Not that particular Monday. And they wonder why. Well, it's very easy. It's very simple to say. The human being is not going to receive the grace of God. And unless a change has taken place in their consciousness that lifts them out of mortality into sonship with God, they are not going to benefit by God. Now, we come to a question. In group meditation, in the teacher tapes, you suggested that it might be a good thing to have a theme or text to meditate on in unison. Would you please enlarge on this? Well, of course. You remember... I've called your attention to that, well, we know now it's a pear tree. I thought it was an apple tree. But my thinking it was an apple tree wouldn't grow apples on it, so there's no use taking thought about apples. But at any rate, you remember the tree. Now, supposing we were to go into meditation and take for our theme that tree when it is barren in winter. In our mind's eye, let us look at the pear tree when it is barren in winter. No leaves on it, no blossoms, no fruit. And now we're going into meditation. 
But we are not going to take a barren tree into meditation. We are going to take life into meditation, of the life of the tree. We never take the barren person, the sick person, the poor person into our meditation. They serve the, ob the purpose of forcing us into a meditation, just like that barren tree now is forcing us into meditation. But now that we're in meditation, we forget the tree and we turn to the word life, or God, or nature. Well, now this is what's happening to me. Unless something is happening, that tree is a barren tree and it might just as well be cut down. We could better use it for firewood than just to let it stand there barren. And judging by appearances, that's what it is, a barren tree. But let us not judge by appearances. Let, let us judge righteous judgment. In other words, let me not believe the evidence of my eyes, but is there something within me that tells me something different? Yes, there is. There's a spiritual faculty within me that says, do not judge by appearances. The law of nature is still in operation. It is functioning right now in that tree. It will be functioning in that tree all through the winter, even when it might seem to be snow-covered. Do not be concerned with this appearance of barrenness. There is a law of nature operating. This law of nature, whether you call it that or whether you call it a law of God or a law of life, it is operating, it is feeding the tree. It is feeding that tree with the nourishment that it needs at this moment. It is this invisible life, this invisible law, invisible nature, that will in due season appear as leaves, buds, blossoms, and eventually fruit. But I must remember That unless I perceive that there is this invisible law at work, then I might as well chop down the tree. Well, so it is that in the next moment, someone presents to me a sick body. And supposing we were all going to meditate about that case. Immediately we would drop from thought the sick body or the sick person. Immediately. Because you never meditate on an effect. You always meditate on cause. Make that note, will you? Never meditate on an effect. You always meditate on cause. And therefore, you turn immediately from that sick person or that sick body or that sick condition and you go back to the invisible. And here is where your spiritual intuition or your spiritual discernment comes to your rescue. And it begins to say to you, I am there. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I am the bread. Or, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And so, all of a sudden, out of your spiritual intuition or spiritual discernment, a message comes to you, and this produces the healing. You must be sure that you never meditate on an effect. 
Never meditate about a person or about a body or about supply or about companionship or about a home or about transportation. Never, never, never meditate on such things. Meditate always on cause. Spirit, the invisible, nature, life, the causative principle, the divine principle of life. Always meditate on God. In this you're fulfilling scripture. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Not stayed on a problem. Not stayed on a person. Stayed on cause. And uh, as you meditate, always on cause, you will then find that up from this spiritual presence, a message will come, and that will be the word of God that we live by. Thank you. not be concerned with this appearance of barrenness. There is a law of nature operating. This law of nature, whether you call it that or whether you call it a law of God or a law of life, it is operating. It is feeding the tree. It is feeding that tree with the nourishment that it needs at this moment. It is this invisible life, this invisible law, invisible nature, that will in due season appear as leaves, buds, blossoms, and eventually fruit. <clears throat> 